Okay, back with chapter 19. Got interrupted there. All right, this one is called The Fish Trap. The more Laura was told about school, the more she did not want to go there. She did not know how she could stay away from the creek all day long. She asked, oh, Ma, do I have to go? Ma said that a great girl, almost eight years old, should be learning to read instead of running wild on the banks of Plum Creek. But I can read, Ma, Laura begged. Please don't make me go to school. I can read. Listen. She took down the book named Mill Bank and opened it up and looking up anxiously at Ma, she read, the doors and the windows of Mill Bank were closed. Crepe streamed from the doorknob. Oh, Laura, said Ma, you're not reading. You're only reciting what you've heard me read to Pa so often. Besides, there are other things to do in school, spelling and writing and arithmetic. Don't say any more about it. You will start school on Monday morning with Mary. Mary was sitting down to sew. She looked like a good little girl who wanted to go to school. Just outside the lean-to door, Pa was hammering at something. Laura went bounding out so quickly that his hammer nearly hit her. Whoop, said Pa, nearly hit you that time. I should have expected you, flutter budget. You're always on hand like a sore thumb. Oh, what are you doing, Pa? Laura asked him. He was nailing together some narrow strips of board left from the house building. Making a fish trap, Pa said. Do you want to help me? Here, you can hand me the nails. One by one, Laura handed him the nails and Pa drove them in. They were making a skeleton box. It was a long, narrow box with a top and Pa left wide cracks between the strips of wood. How will, the, how will that catch fish? Laura asked. If you put it in the creek, they'll swim in through the cracks, but, they, but then they can swim right out again. You wait and see, said Pa. Laura waited till Pa put away the nails and hammer. He put the fish trap on his shoulder and said, you can come with me to help set it. Laura took his hand and skipped beside him down the knoll and across the level land to the creek. They went along the low bank, past the plum thicket. The banks were steeper here. The creek was narrower and the noise was louder. Pa went crashing down through the bushes. Laura climbed scrounging down under them and there was a waterfall. The water ran swift and smooth to the edge and fell over with a loud, surprised crash splashling. From the bottom, it rushed up again and whirled around, and then it jumped and hurried away. Laura would never have tired of watching that waterfall, but she must help Pa set the fish trap. They put it exactly under the waterfall. The whole waterfall went into the trap and boiled up again, more surprised than before. It could not jump out of the trap. It foamed through the cracks. Now you see, Laura, said Pa, the fish will come over the falls and into the trap, and the little ones will get out through the cracks, but the big ones can't. They can't swim back up the falls, so they'll have to stay swimming in the box until I come and get them out. At the very last minute, a big fish came slithering over the falls. Laura squealed and shouted, look, Pa, look. Pa's hands in the water grabbed the fish and lifted him out flopping. Laura almost fell into the waterfall. They looked at that silverly, silvery fat fish and then Pa dropped him into the trap again. Oh, Pa, can't we please stay and catch enough fish for supper? Laura asked. I've got to get to work on the sod barn, Laura, said Pa, and plow the garden and dig a well and... Then he looked at Laura and said, Well, little half pint, maybe it won't take too long. So he sat on his heels and Laura sat on her heels and they waited. The creek poured and splashed, always the same and always changing. Glints of sunshine danced on it. Cool air came up from it and warm air lay on Laura's neck. The bushes held thousands of little leaves against the sky. They smelled sweet and warm in the sun. And here's a picture of them setting the trap. Pretty good idea, huh? Oh, Pa, Laura said, do I have to go to school? You will like school, Laura, Pa said. I like it here better, Laura said mournfully. I know, little half pipe, said Pa, but it isn't everybody who gets a chance to learn to read and write and cipher numbers. 
Your ma was a school teacher when we met, and when she came west with me, I promised her that our girls would have a chance to get to do some book learning. That's why we stopped here, so close to a town, so that it has a school. You're almost eight years old now, and Mary is going on nine, and it is time you girls begun. Be thankful that you're getting the chance, Laura. Yes, Pa, <sighs> sighed Laura. Just then, another big fish came over the waterfall, but before Pa could catch it, here came another. Pa cut and peeled a forked stick. He took four big fish out of the trap and strung them on the stick. Laura and Pa went back to the house, carrying those flopping fish. Ma's eyes got round when she saw them. Pa cut off their heads and stripped out their insides, and then he showed Laura how to scale the fish. He scaled three, and she scaled almost all of one. Then Ma rolled them in meal and fried them in fat, and they ate those good fish for supper. You're always thinking of something, Charles, said Ma, just when I'm wondering where our living is to come from. Now it's spring. Pa could not hunt in the springtime, for then all the rabbits and little rabbits and birds had little birds in their nests. Wait till I harvest that wheat, ha ha, said Pa. Then we'll have salt pork every day. Yes, by gravy and fresh beef. Every morning after that, before he went to work, Pa brought fish from the trap. He never took more than he needed to eat. The others he lifted out of the trap and let them swim away. He brought buffalo fish and pickerel and catfish and shiners and bullheads with two black horns. He brought some home whose names he did not know. Every day there was fish for breakfast and fish for dinner and fish for supper. So they call lunch dinner and they call dinner supper. Okay, chapter 20 is called school. Dun, dun, dun. Monday morning came. As soon as Laura and Mary had washed the breakfast dishes, they went up to the ladder and put on their Sunday dresses. Mary's was a blue sprigged calico and Laura's was red sprigged. Ma braided their hair very tightly and bound the ends with thread. They could not wear their Sunday hair ribbons because they might lose them. They put on their sunbonnets, freshly washed and ironed. Then Ma took them into the bedroom. She knelt down by the box where she kept her best things, and she took out three books. They were the books she had studied when she was a little girl. One was a speller, and one was a reader, and one was arithmetic. She looked solemnly at Mary and Laura, and they were solemn too. I am giving you these books for your very own, Mary and Laura, Ma said. I know you will take care of them and study from them faithfully. Yes, Ma, they said. She gave Mary the books to carry. She gave Laura the little tin pail with their lunch in it under a clean cloth. Goodbye, be good girls, said Ma. Ma and Carrie stood in the doorway and Jack went with them down the knoll. Jack was puzzled. They went on across the grass where the tracks of Pa's wagon wheels went and Jack stayed close beside Laura. When they came to the ford of the creek, he sat down and whined anxiously. Laura had to explain to him that he could not come any farther. She stroked his big head and tried to smooth out his worried wrinkles, but he sat watching and frowning while they waded across the shallow wide ford. They waded carefully and did not splash their clean dresses. A blue heron rose from the water, flapping away with its long legs dangling. Laura and Mary stepped carefully onto the grass. They would not walk in the dusty wheel tracks until their feet were dry, because their feet must be clean when they got to town. The new house looked small on the knoll with the great green prairie spreading far around it. Ma and Carrie had gone inside. Only Jack was watching now. Mary and Laura walked on quietly. Dew was sparkling on the grass. Meadow larks were singing. Snipes were walking on their long, thin legs. Prairie hens were clucking, and tiny prairie chicks were peeping. Rabbits stood up with paws dangling, long ears twitching, and their round eyes staring at Laura and Mary. Pa had said that town was only two and a half miles away, and the road would take them to it. They would know they were in town when they came to a house. Large white clouds sailed in the enormous sky, and in their gray shadows trailed across the waving prairie grasses. The road always ended a little way ahead, but when they came to the ending, the road kept on going. 
It was only the track of Pa's wagon through the grass. For pity's sake, Laura, said Mary, keep your bonnet on. You'll be as brown as an Indian. And what will the town girls think of us? I don't care, said Laura loudly and bravely. You do too, said Mary. I don't either, said Laura. You do too. I don't. You're just as scared of the town as I am, said Mary. Laura did not answer. After a while, she took a hold of her sunbonnet strings and pulled the bonnet up over her head. Anyway, there's two of us, Mary said. They went on and on. After a long time, they saw a town. It looked like small blocks of wood on the prairie. When the road dipped down and they saw only grasses and sky again then, then they saw the town again, always larger. Smoke went up from the stovepipes. The clean, grassy road ended in dust. This dusty road went by a small house and then passed a store. The store had a porch with steps going up to it. Beyond the store, there was a blacksmith shop. It stood back from the road with a bare place in front of it. Inside, a big man in a leather apron made of bellows, puff, puff, out of red coals. He took a white, hot iron out of the coals with tongs and swung a big hammer down on it. Wang! Dozens of sparks flew out tiny in the daylight. Beyond the bare place was the back of a building. Mary and Laura walked close to the side of this building. The ground was hard there. There was no more grass to walk on. In front of this building, another wide, dusty road crossed their road. Mary and Laura stopped. They looked across the dust at the fronts of two more stores. They heard a confused noise of children's voices. Pa's road did not go any further. Come on, said Mary low, but she stood still. It's the school where we hear the hollering. Pa said we would hear it. Laura wanted to turn around and run all the way home. She and Mary went slowly walking out into the dust and turned toward the direction of the voices. They went padding along between the two stores. They passed piles of boards and shingles. That must be the lumber yard where Pa got the boards for their new house. Then they saw the schoolhouse. It was out on the prairie beyond the end of the dusty road. A long path went toward it and through the grass. Boys and girls were in front of it. Laura went along the path toward them and Mary came behind. All those girls and boys stopped their noises and looked. Laura kept on going nearer and nearer to all the eyes and suddenly without meaning to, she swung the dinner pail and called out, you all sound just like a flock of prairie chickens. They were surprised, but they were not as much surprised as Laura was. She was ashamed too and Mary gasped, Laura. Then a freckled boy with yellow colored hair yelled, Snipes yourself, snipes, snipes, long-legged snipes. Laura wanted to sink down and hide her legs. Her dress was sh too short. It was much shorter than the town girls' dresses, and so was Mary's. Before they came to Plum Creek, Ma said they were outgrowing those dresses. Their bare legs did look long and spindly like snipes' legs. So now all the boys were pointing and yelling, snipes, snipes. Then a redheaded girl began pushing those boys and saying, shut up, you're making too much noise. Shut up, Sandy, she said to the redheaded boy. And he shut up. He came close to Laura and said, she came close to Laura and said, my name is Christy Kennedy and that hard boy is my brother, Sandy, but he doesn't mean any harm. What's your name? Her red hair was braided so tightly that her braids were stiff. Her eyes were dark blue, almost black, and her round cheeks were freckled. Her sunbonnet hung down her back. Is that your sister, she said. Those are my sisters. Some big girls were talking to Mary now. The big one is Nettie, and the black-haired one is Cassie. And then there's Donald, and then me and Sandy. How many brothers and sisters do you have? And here's the picture. So it's on two pages. Here's them walking up. And then on the other page, it shows more of the kids outside the schoolhouse. I'll post these pictures so you can see them better. So you can tell that their dresses are shorter than the other girls. Okay. Two, Laura said, that's Mary and carries the baby. She has golden hair too. And we have a bulldog named Jack and we live on Plum Creek. Where do you live? 
Does your pa drive two bay horses with black manes and tails? Christy asked. Yes, said Laura. They're Sam and David, our Christmas horses. He comes by our house. So you came by it too, said Christy. It's the house before you came to Beatles' store in the post office, before you get to the blacksmith shop. Miss Eva Beatles, our teacher. That's Nellie Olson. Nellie Olson, Olson was very pretty. Her yellow hair hung in long curls with two big blue ribbons round on top. Her dress was thin, white lawn with little blue flowers scattered over it and she wore shoes. She looked at Laura and she looked at Mary and she wrinkled up her nose. Hmm, she said, country girls. Before anyone could say anything else, a bell rang and a young lady stood in the schoolhouse doorway swinging the bell in her hand. All the girls and boys hurried by her and into the schoolhouse. She was a beautiful young lady. Her brown hair was frizzled in bangs over her brown eyes and done in thick braids behind. Buttons sparkled all down the front of her bodice and her skirts were drawn back tightly and fell down behind in big puffs and loops. Her face was sweet and her smile was lovely. She laid her hand on Laura's shoulder and said, you're a new little girl, aren't you? Yes, ma'am, said Laura. And this is your sister? Teacher asked, smiling at Mary. Yes, ma'am, said Mary. Then come with me, said Teacher, and I'll write your names in my book. They went with her the whole length of the schoolhouse and stopped up on the platform. The schoolhouse was a room made of new boards. Its ceiling was the underneath of shingles, like the attic ceiling. Long benches stood one behind the other down the middle of the room. They made a plain boards. Each bench had a back and two shelves stuck out from the back over the bench behind. Only the fourth bench didn't have any shelves in front of it and the last bench didn't have any back. There were two glass windows in each side of the schoolhouse. They were open and so was the door. The wind came in and the sound of waving grasses and the smell and the sight of the endless prairie and the great light in the sky. Laura saw all of this while she stood with Mary by the teacher's desk and they told her their names and how old they were. She did not move her head, but her eyes looked around. A water pail stood on a bench by the door. A bought and broom stood in the corner. On the wall behind teacher's desk, there was a smooth space of boards painted black. Under it was a little trough. Some kind of short white sticks lay in the trough and a block of wood with a woolly bit of sheepskin pulled tightly around it and nailed down. Laura wondered what those things were for. Mary showed the teacher how much she could read and spell. But Laura looked at Ma's books and shook her head. She could not read. She was not even sure of all the letters. Well, you can begin at the beginning, Laura, said the teacher, and Mary can study farther on. Have you a slate? They did not have a slate. I will lend you mine, teacher said. You cannot learn to write without a slate. She lifted up the top of her desk and took out the slate. The desk was made like a tall box with one side cut out for her knees. The top rose up on bought and hinges, and under it was the place where she kept things. Her books were there and the ruler. Laura did not know until later that the ruler was to punish anyone who fidgeted or whispered in school. Anyone who was so naughty had to walk up to the teacher's desk and hold out her hand while the teacher slapped it many times with the hard ruler. But Laura and Mary never whispered in school, and they always tried not to fidget. They sat side by side on a bench and studied. Mary's feet rested on the floor, but Laura's dangled. They held their book open on the board shelf before them. Laura studying at the front of the book and Mary studying, sorry, <laughs> farther on and the pages between them standing straight up. Laura was a whole class by herself because she was the only pupil who could not read. Whenever the teacher had time, she called Laura to her desk and helped her learn her letters. Just before dinner time that first day, Laura was able to read C-A-T, cat. Suddenly she remembered and said, P-A-T, pat. Teacher was surprised. R-A-T, rat, said the teacher. M-A-T, mat, said Laura, and Laura was reading. She could read the whole first row in the speller. At noon, all the other children and teacher went home to dinner. Laura and Mary took their dinner pail and sat in the grass against the shady side of the empty schoolhouse. They ate their bread and butter and talked. I like school, Mary said. So do I, said Laura, only it makes my legs tired. 
but I don't like that Nellie Olson who called us country girls. We are country girls, said Mary. Yes, but she didn't need to wrinkle her nose when she said it, said Laura. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, but the next chapter is called Nellie Olson. And as you'll see, she becomes their nemesis. <laughs> okay, so I'll put, post these right now. And if I have time, I'll read some more so you have some chapters for over spring break. I don't know why it's so light on this camera. I've got to fix this. Okay, bye everyone.